All right, so we are recording live. First and foremost, thank you all for joining live and or if you're watching the recording, that is great too. Thank you for taking time out of your night to join us to learn about MS specific physical therapy. This is something that I am extremely passionate about because I used to be what I would call just a regular physical therapist, an orthopedic PT. And it is vastly different from MS specific physical therapy. And I have seen my clients with MS who have been to orthopedic PTs before and they don't get better. They don't improve their walking. They don't improve towards the goals that they're looking towards reaching because they're doing the wrong things. So my goal for this presentation truly is to give you guys the best information that you could leave after this live class and start implementing these things on your own and start getting stronger, start walking better. You can bring the notes that you take from this class to your physical therapist or your personal trainer and see if they can help, help you implement them into your current routine. Or you can work with me through the missing link at the end of this. So regardless, I want you to have a little bit of space around you so that you can do some exercises. We will be doing some together tonight and also a piece of paper and a pen so you can take notes. So let's jump in. Awesome. I see one question already. What can I do with balance? We're going to be talking about that. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay, so as you all know, you have registered for the MS specific physical therapy class. And actually, let me see, this is my first time. Okay, I'm gonna launch a poll on your screen. So you should see something on your screen right now that is asking you, have you attended physical therapy before? And I would love it if you could participate. So option number one is yes, I've done regular physical therapy. Option two is yes, MS specific physical therapy. And then option three is no. And there's no right or wrong answer here. I just wanna get a sense of from the attendees that are participating, where are you guys at in terms of participation? So it looks like for the most part, we've got a lot of people who have done regular PT. About 70% have done regular, 26% has done MS specific, and then 10% have said no. Awesome. So I'm going to end that poll. Thank you guys for letting me know that. We're going to keep going. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is neuroplasticity. This is something that I am extremely passionate about because neuroplasticity is the main reason that anyone with MS actually can get stronger, walk better, get better balance. All of these things that my clients often tell me are their biggest goals. It is possible because of neuroplasticity. So we're going to go over that we're going to go over the two different types of physical therapy because I think it's important for you to know what those differences are in terms of education, but mostly in terms of what it means for you for the actual exercises. Then we're going to go into number three, which is my favorite part. I'm going to tell you guys about some specific exercises and we're going to actually practice some of those. And we're going to go over exercise guidelines because there's not just specific exercises that you should be doing. There's also a specific way that you should be doing it. And that might sound overwhelming, but I'm going to break it down and make it really easy for you. And then number four, we're going to go into how to get access to an MS specialized physical therapist in person telehealth and also through my online program, The Missing Link. And then at the very end, a lot of people's favorite section is going to be the Q and A. So let's jump into neuroplasticity. Hopefully you know what this is. I'm a firm believer that anyone with MS, as well as their loved ones, should be able to explain neuroplasticity to someone else because because that's how important it is. So neuroplasticity is the ability of your brain to create new pathways. So I'm actually going to stop sharing my screen for a second so you can see me a little bit bigger here. So this is really important. Neuroplasticity is the ability that your brain can recreate a pathway. So I'm going to stand up because I want to show you what this looks like specifically for something like walking. So let me move my screen move my chair. We're going to be getting active on this presentation here. So neuroplasticity would mean I'm trying to walk forward and I need to be able to lift my leg up like this. So when I first attempt to lift my leg up like this, it might not work at all. If I show you from this side, maybe there's literally no movement. What that indicates is that this part of my brain that normally sends the pathway here, that pathway didn't work. 
So I said, Dr. Gretchen, try to lift your leg up, lift, 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 lift. And this pathway made nothing happen. So I try a second time. And on my second attempt, lift, 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 lift. My brain, it's not gonna do the same pathway because that didn't work. So on my second attempt, my brain might do a little curly cue and down. Lift, 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 it still didn't lift. On the third attempt, maybe some zigzags. Lift, 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 still didn't lift. And your brain has billions or trillions, I'm not exactly sure the exact number, so many ways to get from point A to point B. And the only way that your brain will find a pathway that works is by continuing to practice the movement. So let's say on my six thousandth try, my brain does swirls all the way down and it lifts a little bit. It's not gonna be miraculous. It's not just gonna be all of a sudden, look how high my leg lifts. But on my 6,000th try, it does curly cues all the way down and it lifts a little bit. What that means is that your brain has now found a connection. It has found a way to get from point A to point B. So from here on out, every time you practice this exercise, your brain is going to use that pathway that it just found. So that's the situation of neuroplasticity if you're starting from a point where there is no strength at all. Sometimes that's the case. Sometimes with foot drop, you might try to lift your toes up and just literally nothing happens. In that case, keep practicing, keep going. Your brain needs to have that repetition in order to find an, a way to get from point A to point B down at your ankle. So if it has zero strength, that's what's going to happen is every repetition, your brain's going to try to find a different way from here to here. Now, if you're someone who does have some strength, so for example, let's use the foot drop example again. If you do slowly lift your, your ankle and it does lift, maybe not as much as your other side, maybe not as much as you want it to, but if it does lift, that means that you do have a pathway from point A to point B that's working. So it's even more important that you keep practicing because you want to strengthen that pathway that does work. So let me know in the comments in the chat section if that makes sense. It is extremely important that you understand it. One way that I also explained it to a missing link member recently, I think it was just the other day, was if you're going to be going to the grocery store. So someone says it does make sense. Awesome. Someone said, or if you go to the grocery store, um, but your typical way that you go has construction. So you have to turn around and go back and then try a different way. Construction again, turn around and go back, go a different way, construction again. Eventually, you'll find a way to get there. It might be some loops and some crazy back roads, but you'll find a way to get there. And that's exactly what your brain does with every repetition. Awesome. I see that's making sense. Yeah. And it is really cool that our brains do that. Okay. Back to the presentation. So I did write on here that it can be good and bad because if you're practicing a movement that is not ideal, maybe it's a funky way of lifting your leg up that maybe could cause a trip or a fall because your leg crosses each other. If it's bad technique, your brain remembers that and is going to use that same movement that you're practicing in your day-to-day -day movement. So it's really important that when you're practicing these exercises, it's good quality. Okay, next up, BDNF is a brain-derived neurotropic factor. And this sounds complex. Basically, it is a protein that is released in our brain and it occurs when we exercise. So when we exercise, this protein is released. It supports survival of existing pathways it supports encouragement of new pathways to be formed, and it actually can help alleviate depression and anxiety. And these, this benefit of having BDNF released in your brain only needs to, will, will occur with only 20 minutes of exercise. So a lot of people will tell me, Dr. Gretchen, I, I can't exercise because I don't have an hour or I, I don't have 30 minutes. Research shows you only need 20 minutes of exercise to get this protein released and to get the body's inflammatory response 
down. And lastly, research also shows that this exercise that I'm talking about only needs to be low to moderate intensity level. It does not need to be high intensity. That's another thing a lot of people tell me, Dr. Gretchen, I can't exercise, I get too tired. You can do low intensity or even moderate intensity and still reap the benefits of neuroplasticity and BDNF. And lastly, MRIs actually prove and they, sh they show that people with MS who exercise consistently and who are more fit have less damage in the parts of their brain that have deterioration. They have improved recovery after MS attacks and reduced long-term disability. So even if you're someone who feels like, you know, I've even done MS specific PT and it just hasn't helped, keep going. MRIs are showing this. It's not just me being an optimistic person saying, keep up your exercise. There's a good way to do it. It's actually proven time and time again in research to help. Physical therapy can help with so many different things. The ones I often talk about are these top ones of strength and balance and aerobic endurance, also walking. It can help with so many different areas, but it is different in the, the way that you get there. So there's different ways to work on strength. There's different ways to work on balance and spasticity in walking. So general physical therapy and FYI, when I say general physical therapy or regular physical therapy, what I mean is orthopedic physical therapy. So this is the type of PT that you would get if you a, don't have any specialists in your area. It's just, you know, your outpatient clinic that you're going to. It's somewhere where you'd go if you have back pain or neck pain or hip pain, or if you've had surgery, maybe back surgery, hip surgery, knee surgery. Um, sometimes you might go there for vertigo. This is where your primary care doctor probably will send you. So to be a physical therapist, you need six to seven years of schooling. Currently, as of like the last 15 years or so, maybe longer, it is a doctorate level program. And you obviously need to pass the NPTE, which is the National Physical Therapy Exam. Now, in physical therapy school, for the most part, it is very generic. You, I think specifically for multiple sclerosis, I learned about it one day and it was just one of the topics that day. It wasn't even a whole day on MS. So you learn neuromuscular things and, and as well as orthopedic and these other areas, but it's very generalized. The idea is that you go to PT school and then you specialize afterwards. So general physical therapy, general conditions. You would focus on strength training, balance and walking, pain reduction. And the biggest thing with this too is that you often push to the point of fatigue. So this is the type of PT that is not ideal for someone with MS. However, it's the most common type that people with MS receive. And just from the poll that I did at the beginning, you'll see 70% of the people, we have currently have 135 people on here, 70% of you guys have had general PT, not MS specific PT. So also comment in the chat right now, if you see any of these exercises on here as examples and you've done them before, I wanna know in the chat which ones you've done. So some great examples of orthopedic or regular PT exercises are straight leg raises, sideline leg raises, the clamshell, squats, bridging, lunges. And it's not that these are bad exercises, they're, they're good exercises, but when you have MS, there isn't that carryover, meaning you might have, so for example, the straight leg raise, and let me pull up the chat here. So where's the chat? There's the chat. So let's see what you guys are saying. So yeah, okay, so you're all saying you've done all of them. Yep, straight leg raise, sideline, clamshell. Okay, so you guys have done these. So you know what I'm talking about. So for example, that, that straight leg raise is for the hip flexors, which is the front of your hip. That's the same muscle group that you need to strengthen in order to lift your leg forward to walk. And you might have full strength with this straight leg raise, but you go to stand up and use those muscles and you can't lift your leg up. That's a perfect example of your brain because of MS and because of demyelination, the nerves, not having the ability to transfer the strength from one position to another. 
So it's very, a lot of these exercises, most of them are lying down. And there are obviously standing and seated exercises from general PT, but this is the type that you get clamshells for your butt area, like those outer hip muscles. You might be able to do that great, but you go to stand up and you still have hip drop because you don't have the hip strength in a standing position. So let's move on to what we all are here for is MS specific physical therapy. So MS specific physical therapy means that you not only have the six to seven years of schooling. And the reason that I say six to seven, by the way, is because there are some programs that are three plus three. So it's three years of undergraduate and then three years of graduate. I did the seven years of schooling. I did four years of undergraduate and then the three years of a graduate. So that's the doctorate program. You have to pass the national physical therapy exam and you need the MS certification. And what this requires is a bunch of observation hours and working with people who have MS, as well as studying for and passing a five hour exam. Now, this is the same exam that neurologists would take if they want to become an MS certified specialist. As well, nurses have their own, but neurologists is the same occupational therapist, physical therapist, and you are quizzed, you're tested on everything and anything and everything, not only the different types of MS, every medication, not just the disease modifying therapies, but all of the symptom management drugs that are out there, different types of actual therapies like physical therapy. It is extremely extent extensive and that's what you need to do and you need to be able to pass that. So from there, you then focus on different things. MS certified physical therapists will focus on functional strengthening. And I'm gonna talk about this more on the next slide. It deserves its own slide, it is that important. Also balance and walking, neuroplasticity as we've already talked about and neuro recovery and compensation. So neuro recovery is the idea that neuroplasticity is going to work. We're recovering those neural pathways and we're gonna get those stronger. Whereas compensation, completely different type of exercise, this type of exercise is often done in addition to neuro recovery exercises because we're going to teach you to compensate because the strength that we're hoping for isn't there yet. So until it gets there, let's strengthen some other muscle groups that can compensate and help you have better movement. And then as you're doing that, you'll still be doing neuroplasticity and then you'll be able to have both in order to have easier movement. Lastly, at least for this slide, an MSPT knows about all of the symptoms versus, okay, let's work on your strength, let's work, let's work on your walking. There is so much more to MS, as you all know. Fatigue is a big one. Primary fatigue is different from secondary fatigue. So being able to know the difference and asking about that, and not only asking, but looking for it. So as you're doing your exercise, they're looking for, for those signs that you might be getting fatigued and you stop right away. You do not want to push into fatigue. Additionally, heat intolerance. Heat intolerance means your core temperature is rising by at least half of a degree or more. And when that happens, multiple symptoms could worsen. Maybe, maybe your weakness comes back, maybe spasticity or tone comes in, maybe you get some double vision or cognitively thinking gets harder and it's because your heat intolerance is rising. So MSPTs would know, okay, let's cool you down even before these things happen if you're someone who has heat intolerance. Additionally, sensation. If we're working on walking exercises or balance and you have decreased sensation in your legs or your feet, you need to do the exercises different because you don't have the same sensation. And, <clears throat> excuse me, vision as well. If there's any type of vertigo, double vision, blurred vision, you wanna be doing the exercises differently so that you can actually do an exercise regardless of the thing that might be causing an impairment like vision or sensation. So functional exercise, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can see me a little bit bigger. This is so important. So ju just as up there with neuroplasticity, functional exercise means that you break down the exercises, or sorry, not exercises, you break down the movements that are hard for you to do, and you put those into exercises. So comment 
in the chat, if you will, if you have gone to physical therapy before and you get in a bike, any type of bike, stationary bike, recumbent bike, the new step, it's a very common bike, you know, you're seated pedaling your feet. I'd love to know if you've been on that. So that is an exercise that a lot of people do. And I often hear, okay, yeah, we've got a bunch of yeses in the chat. I often hear, um, you know, Dr. Gretchen, I'm here to see you because my neurologist told me to, but I actually don't think I'm going to get any better. And my first question is, okay, what have you done in past physical therapy? And nine times out of 10, and normally I'd say 10 times, but I'm trying to be generous. Nine times out of 10, they would say, you know, I would get to go to PT. I'd get on a bike. I could even do it for 30 minutes. And I could even get up to a resistance level of six. Like I was so good at it, but my walking didn't improve. My balance didn't improve. So this isn't going to work either. And that's a perfect example of a non-functional exercise. So Biking is great. Don't get me wrong. It's great for cardio exercise. It can help you strengthen your legs, but biking will help with biking. Biking will not help improve your walking. Think about it. You're in a seated position, whereas walking, you're in a standing position, completely different positions. With biking, you're strengthening to push your leg away from you. With walking, you want to lift your leg up. So again, it's not bad. It's a great exercise. And if you're currently doing it, again, it's good for cardio. It's good for strength. It's great. Keep doing it. But you need to be doing walking exercises if you have a goal of walking better. And in this case, a lot of my clients have a goal of walking better. And they say, you know, that's what I was doing and it didn't work. So in order to walk, and I'll talk about this, I think it's on the next slide or one after, in order to walk better, you need to break down walking. Walking requires, requires seven different things, seven different exercises. It's not just walking. It's not just one thing. So that's really important to understand. So if you have a goal of stair climbing, what does stair climb? Let's break it down. How many movements are required to climb the stairs better? Those are now your exercises. If you have a goal of standing up from the ground, we can break that down probably into at least 10 different movements and exercises. Those are your exercises, not straight leg raises, clamshell. So let me get back to sharing my screen and we'll keep moving. Okay, so what I'm gonna do right now is I'm just gonna demonstrate and feel free to do this with me if you'd like, but I wanna give you another example of what a functional exercise would be. So MS specific exercises are always based on what activities are challenging for you to do. One of my very first questions when I'm talking to my telehealth physical therapy clients, as well as my missing link clients is, what are your goals? And not only that, but what things are hard for you to do? Do you have difficulty climbing stairs, difficulty walking? What about getting into a car, stepping up on a curb, getting into bed, getting out of the shower? Like what activities are hard for you to do? And one of the ones I hear very often is difficulty standing up. So I am going to show you what is required for standing up? And again, if you, if you are safe right now, no, no worries of uh, losing your balance, feel free to try this with me. Otherwise you can just watch. I'm gonna demonstrate what standing up should look like if this is one of your goals. And also just a side note, years and years ago, this was when I was very first an MS specialist, I hosted an event in my hometown. At the time I was living in Boston, Massachusetts, but I came home, I think I was, um, I don't even remember when it was, but regardless, I came home and I hosted an event with my mom, who's a yoga teacher, and it was called MS Yoga and You. And it was an amazing event. I gave a lot of education on how to exercise when you have MS and how to do the right PT, followed by a yoga class. And I will never forget this. Because I wasn't a licensed PT in New York State yet, I wasn't able to answer questions at the end. So there was another physical therapist there who was answering the questions at the end. And this was a physical therapist who is amazing. He was one of my clinical instructors when I was a PT student. He, so many PTs in the Western New York area look up to him. He's an amazing PT. I'll never forget this. 
One of the people there who had MS said, I have difficulty standing up. What do I do? And his advice was, okay, separate your feet and just push up, you know, push your feet down into the ground and push yourself up. And this woman was like, okay. So she, she moved her legs and she pushed and nothing happened. And she said to him, she's like, that doesn't work. What else can I do? And he was like, no, that's what you need to do. And he was explaining it in such an orthopedic way, this general PT way, and she couldn't do it. And in my mind, I'm like, this is not the way that you would teach someone. And for this person that I idolized, this PT, and he had been in the business for like 40 years and he's such a good PT. And for him to not know how to train someone with MS, that's when I realized how important this actually is to educate people. So I'm gonna stop talking and show you, I'm gonna move my screen down and demonstrate for you. Oh, Finn's on the ground over here. Sorry, Finn. Okay, so in order to stand up from a chair, what you need to be able to do is, and I'm gonna go through this quickly and then I'm gonna break it down. So don't feel like you need to write super fast. What you need to do is be at the edge of your chair. So you need to be able to scoot from a reclined position to the edge. That's one thing. You need to be able to move your feet so that they are at least shoulder distance apart. You then need to bring your feet back. If they're too far forward, that's gonna make this movement very hard. So you need to bring your feet back. You then need to shift your weight forward and then so much so that your shoulders are in front of your knees. And when you do that, you'll see my butt just lifted from the chair. If your shoulders can lift forward enough, your butt will almost naturally lift up. So you lean forward and then you push up through your thighs. That's six things, six things to stand up. So a lot of people will come into the PT clinic and they'll say, I, one of my goals is to stand up better. And they think that that's one movement of just strength to stand up. And it's not, it's six things. So just as, a, just as an example, one of your exercises could be moving from a reclined position to sitting up tall and scooting forward. That's actually probably two exercises. Another thing you need to be able to do, let me show you from this angle, is move your legs out. And for some people, that's, that's pretty challenging because you need strength in your outer thigh muscles. You also need flexibility on the inner thigh muscles. If you use spasticity in your legs like to stay nice and close, it's gonna be hard to get out to this position. So you need to be able to move your legs out. That could be an exercise. You also need to be able to bring your knees back. This is a tough one for a lot of people. It requires hamstring strength. You need to be able to pull them back. That could be an exercise. Moving your shoulders forward and down. This could be an exercise. You need to be able to shift your weight. And if when you reach forward, your butt's not coming up, it's because you're not shifting your full body weight. You're just hinging at your hips. So there's lots of different strategies for that. Then once you're here, you need to be able to stand up with your thighs. And then sitting down is a whole nother thing to, in order to sit down without plopping. So a little bit closer. So I hope that makes sense. Ooh, yep, so you can see me. Someone says hi, Finn. Um, so I hope that makes sense. So when you're thinking about your goals, and if you're currently going to PT or currently seeing someone, let them know what activities are hard for you to do because that's what they should be doing. If you say, I have difficulty standing up, they should be breaking that down into at least that many exercises, if not more. Or I think someone said um, getting up from the ground, getting into their bed. So they need to be broken down into exercises. And actually, some people are already doing this. If you haven't already, and if you feel comfortable posting this, post in the comments or the, the chat section with what's, it, what's one of your goals? If you want to list more than one, you can list more than one. But what is just one of your goals that you have that you would love to improve? And, and if it could improve, if you could improve that goal, your life would improve because it would make things easier. I would love to know that. 
Oh, so, uh, someone says, can you use your hands? Um, yes, you can, especially to start off. There's so many different things about standing up. And actually in the missing link, there's a whole video on explaining how to stand up properly, how to sit down without plopping, all of the specifics. You can use your hands, especially if you need to for safety reasons. The goal eventually for, some, for most people would be to not use your hands. But for some people, you might always use your hands. And as long as you can either reach the seat or armrest, then that's fine. Okay, so keep commenting your goals. I wanna see those. Um, I'm gonna go back to sharing my screen. Okay, so this is another one. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen in a second, just so you, I feel like it's better if you can see me in real life, do it versus just a photo. But walking is another big one. And we're actually gonna do a couple of exercises right now. So I'm just going to make sure I do them in the right order. Marching, heel tap and balance. So let me see what time it is, 7.34. So we're gonna do these exercises. I'm going to explain what you need to do in order to walk better. And I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so you can see me. We're just gonna do a couple repetitions of each one. So take these as you will, if you wanna, well, you're already home. I was gonna say, if you wanna go home after this class, after this class, if you wanna practice more, go for it. But these are the things, um, these are the exercises that we're gonna to do today. So again, I'm going to, show you for those of you and if you if you have a goal of walking better let's see yeah a bunch of people stairs walking lisa says balance thomas says balance and walking pauline picking up articles wait picking up fine articles pinching oh hand that's a good one too so in order to walk better There are seven things that you need to do. So I'm gonna show you with this leg right here. So this is the leg I want you paying attention to. So for starters, you need to be able to stand in this staggered stance. So that's number one thing. You need to be able to balance here and shift your weight forward. Then you need to be able to bend your knee, swoop your toes up, bring your knee up, straighten your leg, place your heel down. And all while that was happening, Guess what? I was standing on one leg. So you need single leg balance. So let me recap, okay? You need to be able to stand in staggered stance and shift your weight forward. That alone is probably two different things, but we'll count it as one. You then need to be able to bend your knee, swoop your toes up so you don't have foot drop, bring your knee up, straighten, heel down, and all of that was happening standing on one leg. Now, obviously I am really exaggerating right now, these are movements that I'm exaggerating to demonstrate what the action is. You do not need that much movement in order to walk better, but walking needs to be broken down into those seven different exercises. And there's multiple ways to work on those seven exercises. Those seven exercises are the main point. There's so much more that's in the missing link, but all of those are broken down into many different ways of doing them in the missing link, since most of my members are looking to improve their transfers as well as walking. So what we're gonna do right now are some exercises that will help with walking as well as other things. So even if you're on this and you're thinking to yourself, I don't need to walk better, like that's not my goal, um, that's fine too, these will still help you. So the first one is marching. This is one of my all time favorite. And this is something where I truly believe anyone with MS should be doing so. Let's do it, shall we? Make sure you have some space around you. I'm sorry if I'm making you dizzy at all by constantly moving, but I just wanna show you. So marching is going to be this. So you're gonna be sitting up ideally away from the back of the chair. Core muscles are tight. You can hold on if you need to. Lift up and down, then up and down. So keep going. I'm assuming for most people, there's gonna be one side that is weaker than the other. That's okay, that is normal. But what this exercise helps with is it does help with walking. This is the same thing, that is the same thing as this. It's just sitting versus standing. So the advanced version to make that harder, you would stand up. So this is something that can help with walking. If you're trying this right now and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so hard, or my muscles are cramping, you can try leaning back. 
There's a bunch of different ways to make this easier as well as to make it harder. Again, those are all in the missing link, but not only will this help with walking, it will also help tremendously with stair climbing. In order to climb stairs, you need to be able to lift your leg up. In order to get into your bed, you need to be able to lift your leg up to get into bed. To get into or out of a car, you have to lift your leg up to get in. So this anything with that lifting movement, this exercise can help with. So this is one of my favorites. The second one we're going to do is the heel tap. So this exercise is great for anyone who, when you walk, your, your leg doesn't always go where you want it to go. Perhaps it goes out to the side or it crosses in front of the other one. Oftentimes people will feel like they're walking like they're drunk because their legs just don't, you, it, the placement's not right. So that's what this exercise is. So I'm gonna, sh you won't see my face, but I'm gonna scroll down a little just so you can see the graph, okay. So can you guys see this right here? I'm assuming you can. That just, I just got lucky. That happens to be on the ground right now. However, at your home, if you have carpet, look for a design on the carpet or a stain or a piece of lint, just something that is in front of you that's on the ground. It doesn't have to be of any height. And you're going to sit at the end of your chair. You're going to lift your leg up. So again, it requires that marching and then tap your heel on that item and then back down. And then the same thing again. Now this is working on proprioception, which is the ability of your body to move where you want it to go. And if you don't practice this, it won't improve on its own. It will not improve with strengthening exercises or balance exercises. It has to be proprioception exercises. So this is an example of one when you need to be moving in a specific way, tap, and then back down. And you'd obviously want to do this on both sides and down. Just to point out, this is the same for eating, for eating or anything with your hand. I have some missing link members who have difficulty with eating, partially maybe because of grip strength, but also because of that proprioception of, of grabbing the food and making it to their mouth. So again, practicing, it could even be touching a point, then touching your lip or your nose. It doesn't matter where it is, but practice that specific point and then back to exactly where you want it to go. The last exercise is balance. So yeah, someone just said harder than it looks. I'm glad you said that, Jackie. A lot of these exercises are, they look, I'm making them look easy. They are not easy for a lot of people. And it's actually, if you're finding that it's hard, that means you need to be doing them. That means that this needs to get stronger for you in order to work towards these goals that you have. So I'm glad that you mentioned that. Let's see, Barbara says, I can't lift, I can't lift my right leg, only the left. Yep, keep practicing, Barbara, with, based on neuroplasticity. The more you practice on that right side, the more, every time you practice, your brain is trying to find a connection that will work. So keep practicing. Last one is balance. So as you saw from earlier, walking required single leg balance. Now, if you use an assistive device, that's fine. You can use an assistive device for this exercise. One point about that is if you use an assistive device, you should never be putting so much weight through it, whether it's a walker or a cane, you should never be putting all of your body weight through it. They are not meant to support 100% of our body weight. And in fact, that's more often than not when people fall because something happens to the device and then they slip out. They should just be used for a little bit of balance and support. So you would, if you're practicing that single leg and there's so many different exercises for balance, I'll likely do a completely different webinar specifically on balance because it's very intricate, but this is an exercise that you can do. So hold on to something if you need. You're gonna stand on one leg. The knee is slightly bent, it's not locked. Just lost my balance. And if you can, let go. Now, obviously this also requires strength in this leg to get my leg off the ground. Again, there's lots of other ways that you can do that. 
and then you could do the same thing on the other side. And then the other piece of balance for walking that we talked about was staggered stance. So especially if single leg is too hard for you right now, there's a staggered stance balance that you can practice. Just literally practice balancing here. That's, it's as simple as that. And one thing that I do with balance that is also very MS specific is once you can balance in a specific position, then we work on weight shifting because there's a difference between static balance, balancing in one spot, and then being able to balance while you're reaching for something and not falling over. So weight shifting is another really, really important one. Okay, I hope those were helpful. We're gonna go back to sharing my screen. So newest guidelines, the very first thing is that aerobic exercise done first has been shown to increase neuroplasticity. So it primes your brain for neuroplasticity to happen. So they say that you should do aerobic exercise first. Functional exercise, you already know, that's what the types of exercises need to be. You need to have perfect quality because remember from the neuroplasticity slide, if you have bad quality, your brain's going to remember that. So perfect quality, as many repetitions as you can because the more repetitions, that means that the more times your brain is trying to find that connection. And that those two things alone, the perfect quality and high repetition, more often than not means lots of rest breaks. So don't ever feel like you need, need to do 10 times three sets. You might do 10 times your first set, but your second set might be five because you're a little bit more fatigued. Your third set might be three. Your fourth and fifth set might also be three. Your sixth set. So just take as many rest breaks as you need to have good quality. And... I want you again to comment in the chat. I just, I wanna know who my audience is today. So I want you to comment in the chat if you're the type of person who would like to exercise throughout the day or all at once. And this I think is a personality type. There's just some people who would rather do one or the other. So I'd love to know which you are. The reason I ask is because there are ways to exercise more effectively. And recent research indicates that if you could, we have people answering, it indicates that if you are someone who likes to exercise throughout the day, that is just as effective as exercising all at once. And the reason that that is so important is because I used to hear all the time and still do, Dr. Gretchen, I just can't exercise because I don't have an hour or, or 30 minutes. Honestly, you can do exercises five minutes in the morning, 10 minutes at, at lunchtime, maybe five minutes early afternoon. You can break it up, it's just as effective. The second thing is a variable environment versus constant. If you want, comment in the chat. If you always exercise in the same spot, if you always exercise in the same constant environment, that's not as good as a variable environment. And a perfect example of this, one of my in-person PT clients would come in and she was perfect at standing up from a chair. That was one of her biggest goals. We were working on it. She was doing great. And one day her husband came in and said, Dr. Gretchen, I don't know what you're doing in here that's magic because I see her do it with you and it looks perfect. And we get home and she can't do it at all. And as soon as he said that, I was like, the reason is because we were always doing it in the same chair in the same PT clinic. So as soon as he said that, we started doing it in in different chairs, some higher, some lower, some benches. We would go across the hall to the neurology office and use their chairs. We would use different surfaces in different rooms. And then that's when he started reporting later on that that actually was helpful and now she was doing better at home. And then lastly, random order is better than blocked order. Meaning for walking, you know how I demonstrated those seven things, you wouldn't wanna always practice them in the same order, switch it up, switch, switch up the way that you exercise and then put them all together. So my last topic is how to get access to an MS specialized PT. And truly, hopefully by now you feel like, okay, I know a lot of things that I can do and I know how to implement them. And you might even be able to do them on your own. However, if you are looking for 
someone to help guide you, an MS specialized PT to help guide you. For in-person physical therapy, you can check out the MS Society's website and they have something called a care partner. And this is actually an application process that PTs as well as other um, neurologists, occupational therapists, et cetera, have to go through in order to be an official care partner. So if they are a care partner through the MS Society, you know that not only are they an MS specialist, but they also are in a clinic that is handicap accessible. The second thing is the consortium of MS centers. This is the company who you can get the MS specialization through, and they do have an area on, on their website where you can find MS specialists near you. And then lastly, feel free to just call your local PT clinics and see if they have an MS specialist. And just so you know, I think I forgot to mention this before, MS specialists are different than neuro specialists. NCS, neuro certified specialist, is not the same. It's a step up from a regular PT or an orthopedic PT, because they do have extra knowledge in neurodiagnoses, but it's all of neuro, whereas an MS specialist is MS only. So try, ask your local clinics if they have anyone who is an MS specialist. Also ask them if they are offering telehealth PT. Obviously with COVID going on right now, telehealth PT is becoming more popular. So see if any clinics are offering that who do have an MS specialist. And then the last thing I wanna to talk to you about before we jump to the Q&A, it looks like we have a bunch of questions so far, is the missing link. So the missing link is something that I developed because I found that even though I was a local MS specialized PT in the Boston, Massachusetts area, a lot of my clients couldn't get to me consistently because of transportation or weather or just a bad fatigue day or they just weren't feeling good that day. And therefore they weren't coming consistently and they weren't able to get, get work done towards those goals that they had. So they weren't improving either at all or as quickly, but it wasn't because they weren't doing the right things. It's just that they weren't doing it consistently and they didn't know what to do. So that's when I created my online program so that I could have access to, so that I could give them an access to an online platform that they could literally do in their living room. And this is a screenshot of one of the videos that I have in there. So I demonstrate all of the exercises in my living room because that's where you can do all of these. And they're exercises for people who are looking to get stronger, improve their strength, improve their flexibility, balance better in all of the positions, not just for walking, but all areas of life and, and also walking better. There's so many different neuroplasticity based exercises and research proven exercises for each of these four categories and they're all in the missing link. So it's essentially access to me as a physical therapist online and all the content is in there. Additionally, home exercise programs. So I'm the type of person where if you give me a bunch of exercises, I will probably be overwhelmed and not know what to do and therefore not do it. Even if I'm paying for a gym membership that has online access, I probably won't do it. I need a calendar that tells me what to do. What do I do on each day? So that's what the missing link has. There are a couple different ones. One focuses more on strength and flexibility, balance, walking, all those different things. So it tells you exactly what to do each day. That's more of the exercise portion. We also have the things on this slide. So my favorite category is this task specific exercise category. I saw you guys comment in the chat of, with a bunch of different activities that are hard for you to do and goals that you're working towards, like getting into the shower, getting up off the ground, stair climbing, getting into bed. There's so many activities that we have to do throughout our day. And in these videos, I demonstrate exactly how to do it and then additionally provide exercises that you should do to get stronger at that movement. So all of these exercise videos, the ones on the last page and the ones on this page are videos of me demonstrating how to do it, where you should be feeling it, how to do it properly versus improperly, and exactly the technique that you should be using. We also have symptom management videos. So if you're someone who struggles with fatigue, we have energy conservation tips in there. If you're someone who struggles with heat intolerance, 
We have, we have heat intolerance and cooling device strategies in the missing link. If you're someone who struggles with doing two things at once, there's actually a cognitive exercise that you can do to improve that uh, sensation. So with any type of MS symptom that's not exercise, like that's not a physical thing, but it's more of something else, that those are in the symptom management section. We also have research updates. I am a firm believer that people with MS have enough to focus on, that I want to bring research to you. I don't feel like you should have to go and learn about the newest drugs and newest therapies that are happening. You should be focusing on your exercises as well as just having fun in life. I will bring the other information to you. So that's what I do in research updates. We have monthly guest speakers, another favorite category of mine. I bring in other MS experts. And so we've had a bunch of MS neurologists and it's mostly a Q&A section. So you can, or Q&A session. So you can ask them live what your questions are. We've had MS neurologists, occupational therapists, speech and swallowing therapists, um, yoga, yoga practitioners, routine experts. We've had so many different ones and you get access to all of them. As, and they're also recorded. So if you can't make them live similar to this, you can watch the recording. And then last but not least is the accountability and the Q&A. We do have an exclusive accountability group and it's on Facebook. And I'm also a firm believer that you could have the best exercises in the world, but if you're not held accountable, you're not gonna do them. So we have this accountability group where I come live in that Facebook group once a week and I talk about a specific topic. Often those topics are requested by my Missing Link members. So I educate on those. And we have a monthly prize for anyone who submits their exercise tracker each week. You get entered to win the prize. And it might sound silly to a lot of people, but it's something that is exciting and it will help you stay on track towards actually doing the exercises. And people can post questions in this group and communicate with each other as well as me. So it's just a way that I can feel like I'm actually in this with you versus you being on your own with this program. It's online, you're in your living room and no one ever talks to you again. So this is something where I can be with you. So my clients often, almost on a daily basis, will message me saying that because of the missing link, they feel more energized, they feel stronger, they feel empowered, they feel like more like their normal self again. I always get a little choked up at this because that this is huge. And I've seen this in my in-person clients and tons of my missing link members. And if you can improve your quality of life, if you can feel more energized, imagine what you could do. Maybe you could go out to dinner at night because you have more energy, or maybe you can go like hang out with your friends or your family a little bit more, or you can just do your activities that you want to do throughout the day because you're not as tired and because you're strong enough to be able to do them. And if you're feeling more empowered and more like your normal self, it just, it reduces that social isolation and it improves your energy and your mobility on so many different levels. And I just wanted to point out two testimonials. There are a ton that you can find on my website, but these are two that I, that are very frequent. I hear these a lot. So I just wanted to point them out. The first one um, says, this might sound crazy, but I feel like I'm seeing improvements already, even on my second day going into my missing link exercises. She had signed up three days ago. This program is the best I have seen. I'm hopeful and excited about this journey. So there's so many things that I loved about this that I wanted to point out. First of all, at how quick she's seeing improvements. Some people have that neuroplasticity kick in rather quickly, and they just need to be reminded of how they should be moving and of what muscles they should be using. And this specific member who, who left this testimonial, she had done other MS specific exercise programs before. They weren't really working for her. So she decided to switch to the missing link and this is, was her result. And the other thing I like about this is that she says she's feeling hopeful and excited. How rare is it, especially with MS, but even in general, that you can feel hopeful and excited about exercise and about getting stronger. So this one really touched my heart. And then the second one, improvements I've noticed within my first few months as a Missing Link member, I can walk without a cane when the weather has no humidity. I can hold I can hold better balance. I have better self-esteem because I feel like my MS isn't in control as often. <sighs> I don't know if any of those resonate with you, but these are things that I hear often. And 
I feel so honored and grateful that this is something that I can offer to the world. I don't know if anyone has asked this yet, but we have, you can be living in any country and get access to the missing link because it is all virtual. So another question I get asked is how much does this cost? So I just wanted to include it here. So there's three different options. There is a monthly option for $107 a month, semi-annual for $577, and then annual for $1,027. And for each of these, you can cancel at any time. And also, even if you cancel, you get lifetime access to our accountability group because I'm a firm believer that we all need accountability. And if you've been part of the missing link in the past, even when you, if and when you cancel, I will not take you out of that group. If I can still help you on some level, even though you don't have the program, but you're motivated by my weekly chats or you're participating in the exercise trackers and you're doing the things, that is my main goal is to help you do your best, not only with your exercise, but to actually see improvements throughout the rest of your life towards these goals that you're working towards. So if you are interested in checking these out, the link is right there. I can also type this in the chat once I'm not sharing my screen anymore. And then lastly, for anyone who signs up for the missing link for any of those options, by next Thursday, I am actually hosting a bonus mastermind class. And this is specifically going to be on how to stay consistent with your exercise, right? Because if you have all the exercises, that's great. And you have a calendar and you have our accountability group, but none of this works unless you're doing it. So this mastermind class is going to be how to stay consistent with exercise, how to make exercise and habit so that you actually do it, how to get back on track if and when you fall off, because most of the time at some point in our life, we always fall off with our exercises. So how to get back on track when that happens, how to stay motivated, and then as always a Q&A. Because one thing that I hear from a lot of my in-person clients, telehealth clients, and Missing Link members is they need help with consistency and motivation. So that's what this bonus mastermind class is going to be. It, the only people getting the link for this is going to be mi missing link members. So if you sign up by next Thursday, you will also get an invite to this mastermind class. Again, the link is down below. And I'm gonna open it up, it's eight o'clock right now, but we'll go a little bit over. I'm going to open it up to a QA and a uh, session right now. So let me stop sharing. And if you do um, wanna send me an email with any questions, there's my YouTube, my Instagram, I also have a Facebook, um, my website, all of this is available to you as well. So I just posted in the chat, um, the link. Again, I'm sorry, it's already eight o'clock. I am going to answer some questions right now. But for those of you that have to ha hop off, thank you so much for joining. And I'm going to go over some of the Q&A. So let's see. So the first one, most of my lesions are on my spine. Is that different? That is a great question. The, there's less research on neuroplasticity and spine lesions versus brain lesions. However, there's no research yet saying that it doesn't occur. So my stance on it is do the same thing. Let's treat it the same because if it does have the same effect as the brain lesions, you're gonna wanna have lots of practice. You're not gonna wanna start doing these exercises when that research comes out, which who knows, maybe that'll be a couple years or 10 years from now. So my thought is always start early. Um, next one. When I practice marching in place, I can lift my leg okay, but each rep I can't lift it as high as the previous rep until it's too difficult to lift at all. Yep, and the question is what could be going on? That is completely normal. So what's going on is the muscle is getting fatigued because you, even though it might be a simple exercise, it's a challenging one. It uses your hip flexors almost exclusively. There are very few muscles that can help out to compensate. So when you lift your leg, it's going to get it harder each and every set. So what I usually say is I would stop as soon as your leg lift is about 50% as high as it was your first rep, then just stop and rest. Likely what you'll find is if you take like a 10 or 15 second rest, maybe 30 seconds, then do it again, you'll be back up to a higher height. Uh, next one, how do you explain the difference between spasticity and tone? This is a great one. So without getting too technical, there are four levels of spasticity and 
tone is more so muscle tightness that is a lower level of spasticity. At least that's how I like to think of it and explain it. So tone is often something that, um, is, that represents muscle tightness, whereas spasticity in its extreme form, you can't move the muscle. So just to showing you my bicep, tone might be, I've got a lot of tightness here, but I can still move it. It's just hard, harder to straighten it. Whereas the later levels of spasticity might mean I can't straighten it at all because that muscle is rigid. It's like, it's very spastic. But there are some forms like grade one and two, a little bit of three of spasticity. You can actually move it, but grade three of spasticity, you can't straighten it fully. Grade two, there's resistance, but you can get it to fully straighten. And then grade one is more of that tone where there is still resistance, but it moves. Next one, um, if foot drop, sorry, if foot only drops sometimes, should it still be practiced or practiced by walking? I mean, I might be biased, but I am, and I would love for everyone, if you even have a little bit of foot drop or even none at all, it's such a good exercise for prevention too. So I would say, yes, even if the foot drop only occurs sometimes, I personally would still do it. Uh, next one, there is so much focus on brain damage here and with MS nurses, et cetera. Spinal lesions are my bigger issue. Can messages be rerouted through the spine as well? So that kind of goes back to that first question. So there's less research on that. I haven't seen any research really showing yes or no. So I, I handle it the same as the brain lesions. So I hope that helps. The straight leg raise is when you are at, as someone asks, is a straight leg raise when standing or sitting? So the straight leg raise is actually when you're lying on your back, you have one knee bent and the other leg is straight and you slowly lift and then slowly down. It's one of my favorite orthopedic ones, but it just isn't that helpful when it comes to multiple sclerosis. Are vestibular exercises worthwhile? Like walking, looking to the right and left? Yes. Short answer to that they are worthwhile. There's lots of different vestibular exercises that you can do, so that's just one of them, but they are helpful. There's also different types of vestibular issues, so maybe I'll do a different presentation on that as well. Um, another one, um, so someone said, what is the best bike to use? What about a treadmill? I don't have a specific, um, specific I, re I very rarely actually use equipment. There is so much that you can do at home without any equipment. Um, for a bike, I do like the new step, uh, I think it's easy to use. Uh, I don't have a favorite treadmill, so I'm sorry if that's not as helpful. Um, let's see how to find an MS or neuro-based PT. So hopefully that one was answered. Um, if not, is a personal trainer a better option than general PT? Um, again, I might be a little biased just because I'm a PT. A personal trainer uh, the education that they get is even more generic and very heavily focused on people who don't have neurological issues. I used to work as a physical therapist, obviously in a gym, and there were personal trainers there. And once a month, the PTs would ed educate the personal trainers on a specific topic. Sometimes it's, you know, how, what type of exercises are safe for people who have back pain because of spinal stenosis, or what type of exercises would you do for someone who um, has bad balance or something. And they, it might've just been the, P, the trainers that I worked with, but most of the time, unless they go through further education, the generic personal training education doesn't teach you how to adapt exercises. Uh, to things like multiple sclerosis, like specific things like that. So I would say a general PT would be better, but again, I might be biased. Um, let's answer, it's 8.07, we'll go until 8.10, so I'll answer a few more questions. Um, let's see, currently I'm walking well, usually two miles a day, and strength exercises. Should I also be doing these small specific exercises? Yes, to end the end of the question was, I'm getting so excited. The end of the question was, should I also be doing these small and specific MS exercises to maintain those pathways? Absolutely. I have had many people come see me in the PT clinic and they're doing great. They're walking. Some of them are even runners. Uh, they can do stairs well. And I give them these exercises and sometimes they're like, whoa, 
I didn't realize the, this would be that, that challenging. So I say always do these exercises as prevention measures, measures and to keep those neural pathways that you have strong and active so that hopefully if your MS does regress a little bit more, hopefully you wouldn't even notice because you're strengthening those pathways so much. If I do it broken up, what about aerobic? Speaking of all once versus throughout the day. Aerobic exercise, there's less uh, research on. So to my knowledge, aerobic, aerobic counts if it gets your heart rate going. So for some people that might, that might mean five minutes of, of aerobic exercise then, and that's enough. There is no research yet indicating how long your aerobic exercise needs to be before you do the physical therapy exercises, the neuroplasticity based exercises. So because of that, yeah, you could do it throughout the day as, if you wanted. It wouldn't really work if you're doing small bouts and your heart rate's not really getting up. You want your heart rate to feel like, yes, I'm exercising and getting some work done. My feet burn all the time and my right heel hurts constantly. My right leg is my bad leg. So there's no question to this one. Um, uh, I'm trying to think of what I could say as a, an answer. There are sensation exercises as well. And again, that's, that's one of the ones that's in the missing link. Um, someone asked if I'll be doing this again. I am planning, I'm, I might even send you guys a questionnaire. I'd love your feedback. If you do think I should do this again, maybe just type in the chat if you're still on. Um, if you'd want me to offer these again, the reason that I chose MS specific physical therapy is because I quizzed my social media followers. and I just said, what topic would you like to learn about the most? And I gave a bunch of different topics. And this is the one that most people voted for, but there's a lot of different topics that we can talk about. So, um, I hope that, okay. A lot of people are saying yes. So I, I can do this again. Um, let's answer a couple more. I hate not being able to answer all these questions. Um, someone says, when I bike at home within five minutes, I get foot drop and shaky leg and tight tendons. I push through, but I'm concerned I'm training my brain negatively. Yes. I'm so glad I decided to answer this one. Your brain is learning whatever you're teaching it to do. So if you are, in this case, this person said bike, but if you're doing any exercise and every time you're exercising, you're exercising to the point of tightness and shakiness or any negative thing that happens, you are training your brain that exercise means get tight and exercise means let's get shaky. So you want to always stop before anything bad happens. And this can be challenging for some people because for some people, you might not get those things right away. It might be 40 minutes later or the next day. And it is a little bit trickier in that case, but it is doable, you know, monitor throughout, take longer breaks. There's whole strategies on that. Um, but you, most importantly, you do not want to, you don't want to push yourself to the point where any negative thing is happening, happening because then you're training your brain that that's what you want it to, uh, to do that that's what it's going to associate it with so okay it's 8 11 i'm going to stop answering questions there thank you guys so much for joining for all of your questions if you have any other questions if you're considering joining the missing link my email is always open gretchen at drgretchenholly.com um, again i'll post the link in here one last time if you wanted to head over to the membership page if you sign up by next Thursday, I am going to be hosting that exclusive mastermind group live class on how to stay consistent, get consistent, stay motivated. So thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate your time and I hope you learned a lot. I hope to hear from you soon.